David, how are you? Doing well. Good stuff. Good stuff. I, uh, I'm a fully vaccinated man. Yes, I got mine framed uh, or laminated <laughs> over there. I don't want to lose it. It's our freedom. So, I know. I know. Yeah. I'm waiting on this. Uh, hopefully, it's been about 12 hours to, well, 24 hours to a minute since I've gotten my injection. So, no side effects yet. So, so far. Uh, water. Promise this is water again, not wine. <laughs> yeah. What's that? The color of the glass? I saw that on the replay of the other one. I'm like, what is he hitting there? It's a bit yeah. early, a bit early yeah. for that. Well, yeah, we're good. um we're up, we're recording. So this is um episode number three. We're three, David. You're the yes. Eight. We've been busy in kicking off May here. This is three. Absolutely. So yeah, we're excited this week. Um, we're joined by a special guest. Um, so Lauren Saunders and neither of us who who we've met personally, David or I, but through a contact. Um, who works in the, the OT space and kind of the, the stroke rehab um, tech area. And so she is from a company called Neurolutions. And Neurolutions recently received FDA clearance um, for a, their rehab device. And I'll just read a snippet here from, from the article, just as a kind of an intro. And then we see, I see Lauren waiting here. So we'll bring her in and she'll do a lot better of a job than I will. <laughs> but um so this is very recently, um, the Neurolutions ISPE Hand Upper Extremity Rehab System is a brain-computer interface, what they call a BCI device, that assists in rehabilitation for stroke patients with upper arm or upper extremity, so either the hand or wrist or arm, to, to kind of bring folks through, through rehab there. So it's quite interesting, um, and, and really one of the first in space to get this FDA um, clearance. So Today's discussion is really going to evolve around, you know, what that means for stroke survivors, for, you know, OTs who are looking to use devices like this, um, and really kind of go down that route of what we believe, you know, is the future of, of stroke rehab in the home. So I it? want to hear more. Let's bring her yeah. in. Cool. So we'll bring her in here in a second. Admitting. Hi, Lauren. Welcome. Good morning. How are you? We are good. Good. Thanks for joining us. You have some setup there. Are you? Is that? <laughs> I would say that's the office, though, right? That you know, you didn't build that in your in your home office. Um, this is yeah. This is at the office, but I also do um, vlogging for NeuroVlog as well with some other clinicians. So this is my my mini setup at the office. <laughs> Very cool. We like well, it. Mike gives me a hard time. <laughs> about this one right here. So it's just, oh. you just upscaled it. So well, what welcome. are you using? I'm curious. Um, I just use a ATR. It's a, you know, kind of an entry level mic, but um, mm -hmm. it, it helps to drown out the barking puppy. That's a, a level yeah. below. I am recording from, from home. <laughs> so hopefully um, this is his uh, time to take a little break. Yeah. So we're excited to have you on. Welcome. Oh, no. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah. So I gave a, a short intro before uh, we, we got you in the room, Lauren. Uh, but, you know, David and I, obviously, we we haven't met you, you personally, um, but through a connection who who David and I both know and your colleague. Um, so, yeah, maybe just kind of give a brief overview of kind of your background, where, where I know you're calling from. Is it St. Louis today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so okay. I'm from St. Louis, born and raised in St. Louis. I am an occupational therapist by background. I have advanced certifications in brain injury and in stroke rehab. I I'm pretty much a neuro nerd, to be very honest. Um, I just love all things neuro and I've always been fascinated by it. Um, I primarily for actually about eight years was seeing patients in an outpatient neuro rehab facility here in St. Louis um, at the Rehab Institute of St. Louis, which is very tightly woven with Washington University in St. Louis. And so working there, I'm always fascinated by neuro and I could go on and on and on about that. So I won't <laughs> bore you on that, but um, I was presented kind of an opportunity at WashU, there was some researchers, they had this question that really led me down the path with Neurolutions. And that was kind of this, I'm gonna talk about it in an expedited fashion, but going from outpatient neuro, seeing patients, to also simultaneously 
uh, being a clinical specialist, developing prototype for this device, the clinical study, the clinical protocol, seeing out that protocol, publishing that protocol, and then joining Neurolutions afterwards to continue the clinical project. So in a very large nutshell, and I can dive into any one of those avenues if you want me to, but. I'll let you, what way do you want to steer it, David? Because that's, that's. Well, I, I'd love to get into the technology. I'd love to get yeah. into what, what is the, what is this groundbreaking that you had, had some, what they refer to maybe for our audience that refers to the, the, your your device recently, the Ipsy hand recently got um, de novo classification by the FDA. Can you describe what that means to our yeah. audience? Yeah, so actually it's kind of a two-part process here. So we actually received breakthrough medical device designation in July of 2020. And in order to be even considered or given that designation, you one have to prove clinical evidence that you have um, either greatly benefited a patient population. The other criteria is that it's one, it's good for all, but there's nothing out there like your technology that has ever been done before. And that's the other criteria that was met. So in July of 2020, we were considered a breakthrough medical device, but still needed clearance in the market. And so since it was a never before seen technology, it was the de novo pathway, which is a, and working with the FDA, I will have to say is absolutely wonderful. Um, they're wonderful in making sure that everything is, is correct. We look at the data correctly. And, and I, I actually very much admire that as a client. So maybe for those who, who are listening who are still trying to wrap their head around with FDA and, and really, you know, these, these terms, but let's, let's maybe backtrack a little bit. And, and what, so what is this behind, you know, it, I know it's, you know, for you know, spasticity and, and upper arm rehab, but, you know, describe that a bit. And, you know, what, again, when you got that classification, what does make you guys different on the market? Yeah, so I'll kind of take a step back in the technology. So this is the first ever brain computer interface that's been approved by the FDA in the stroke population. And so taking that kind of step back, the brain computer interface means we can take a specific signal within the brain and I'll, I can talk about that technology and convert it by a computer to control an output. So that's kind of the, the main definition of a brain computer interface. So what the Ipsy hand does is we look at, so the, the classic dogma is if somebody has a stroke, let's say it was a a right-sided CVA with left hemipresis, we know that the injury was on the right side of the brain. And we also know that 90% of those motor fibers to control that left side of the body was on the right side of the brain. However, our preliminary research show that there's actually 10% of motor fibers on the same side of the movement of the arm that's impaired that controls their intention to want to move that side. So what we've done is we took a non-invasive means, which is an EEG headset. Um, it's dry electrode. So really it's a bunch of stethoscopes that sit on your head that are just listening to your thoughts. And we could tap into the healthy side of the brain, that 10%. And when somebody thinks, I want to move and I'm intending to move this hand and open and close it, we can control it by them wearing a robotic exoskeleton handpiece where they can control that opening and closing of their hand using their thoughts alone. Um, so that is the technology in a nutshell. A lot of people are stepping into brain computer interfaces. Um, a differentiator is that they are also using implantables. People are using ECOG sensors um, and, and you know, which would be a minor procedure, but what we are doing is non-invasive. It's simply just a headset that you pop on and we can get the same um, quality of, of brain computer interfacing. Interesting. Yeah, and it seems like you guys and Elon Musk are the only ones. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he's he's very much into implantables right now. I saw recently with the the pigs and uh, the monkeys. So, <laughs> but yes. <laughs> That's fascinating. So you know, for for stroke patients, like obviously this is very new, and this is you know something that you know when you talk about electrodes, you know, on their heads, and you know a stroke population as it is, you know they've already had something, you know neurological happened to it. it might be a bit worrying you know so how do you kind of go about 
ensuring that safety and you know obviously the fda helps but like yeah from a, from a usability perspective you know what would that yeah. experience be like for a yeah. Um, so in, and we can talk about it more, but a lot of our subjects in the studies um, were one eager to, to use the device, but it was designed. Um, and I know, you know, Lauren Sheehan, Lauren Sheehan and myself really took a lot of care into what we look at the user design and the user experience um, on top of it being safety, but we just also want it to be very easy and not so daunting to use and specifically catered to the needs of this patient population. So we did take a lot of care to ensure that donning and putting on this device was comfortable. It was easy to do one handed and that the instructions were simple and easy to use. And in fact, all of our subjects and every clinical trial that we had used the system at home. We were okay. able to train them, send it home and just check on them every two to four weeks, depending on the study. Um, so all of the therapy was done at home and not in clinic. Can you use the device in clinic? Yes, and we know that you can, um, but we wanted to leverage a high intense rehab that anyone could access and have in the home. And it is developed in a way that the clinicians can check in and look at their data, see if they're using the device, see if the signal's correct. And if it's not, we can always jump in to intervene and help. So. And Lauren, what type of data on the, with, with this being driven from the home back to the clinic side or to the, uh, the, the data that comes through, what, what, what are you capturing and, and what, mm -hmm. what can you trend on that side? Yeah. So good question. In our studies, we had them use the device a minimum of five out of seven days a week for 12 weeks minimum. We also know that by the timing of the therapy that we have, that if they completed a session every day that they would be getting in roughly about 150 repetitions a day. And so what we're going to look at is one was the signal quality good, make sure it wasn't noisy. And if it was, we'll ask and maybe make sure the setup was um, ideal. And then we're also looking at those repetitions and the accuracy that they were actually hitting the right signal to getting the appropriate feedback they needed. So we're looking at number of reps and then signal quality in that. Great. And go ahead, Mike, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, so like when we think about, I, I did a lot of work um, for my research out of, out of graduate school, looking at specifically the VR space right, for, mm -hmm. for upper arm and, and stroke rehab. And that's really, it's taken some legs, but I, I think we're, it's still trying to prove its efficacy. But I think the greatest use for VR and similarly to what you're building is kind of, you know, one, the repetition, but to kind of take that experience to the home. But mm -hmm. how, how have you gone about trying to motivate i mean five out of seven days i don't like even you know top athletes don't train that much you know but it's hard it's, yeah, yeah it's, it's tough it's and i think and this is me putting on my clinical mindset um and knowing and keeping up on the evidence is that we know that people are going to recover better and do better the more intense their rehab is and i think you know we look at that that is tough you know five out of seven days a week for 12 weeks and it does take that dedication um, I also think that it needs to be very apparent up front with our stroke survivors that it does take that much. Mm -hmm. And whether we like it or not, the intensity has to be there um, to gain that motor recovery. It, it truly does. And so it's tough, but motivating, um, that was definitely something we looked in the studies. And some people, they didn't meet the five out of seven days a week all the time. No, not everyone was perfect, but that was that bar we wanted to shoot for. And so in our studies, the repetitions across their time of usage is different from person to person. You have people who didn't use it as much, people who used it, you know, two to three times a day. So we kind of had a nice bell curve of people who were across the gamut with that. So. And maybe what? just, sorry, David, yeah, it's disgusting. So, um, so what, what pop, like, at what stage of rehab? Because there's always that disgusting word of plateau, right? Oh, yes. Right? That's um, so many stroke survivors <laughs> here. You know, can this be used for a stroke survivor who's 20 years post-stroke and kind of obviously mm -hmm. start, it's all about reps. Yeah. So you will see the improvement, but at what kind of stage of recovery um, did you look at those for the-, for the Yeah, the so um, because all of our studies, we chose chronic stroke. And the reason we do that is because of that nasty word we hear, plateau. And mm -hmm. it's usually a common notion that at six months, most of the, the motor recovery or the chance of spontaneous recovery diminished. And so we chose 
that population because we don't want any confounding of spontaneous recovery. We truly want to look at what our intervention is doing. Um, so we chose that population and we had people who were anywhere six months post-stroke all the way up to even 22 years post-stroke. And so it really didn't matter. And uh, we saw gains in responses across kind of all post years of stroke. Um, so, which is, and there's lots of theories to why I have a few theories as to why, but, um, but we did see it kind of across the, the years post stroke. So. I have to ask you on the clinical side, um, with your training protocol, was it standardized or was it task specific according to maybe the goals of the intention? Mm -hmm. that the so it was, it was kind of a two part. So the, the beginning of the actual therapy from the BCI, which is, you know, do this five out of seven days a week for 12 weeks. And then we would always encourage functional use. Um, they would identify items that they wish that they could do on the Canadian occupational performance measure. Um, and then we would encourage them to try to do that. And in later studies, we were also looking at function with bilateral upper extremity use in the arm motor ability test as well. It wasn't our primary outcome measure, but that had huge gains actually. Um, but more to come on that. I'll tell you guys on that later. Um, so truly we would say, use your hand as much as you can and as, incorporate as much as you're able and kind of left that loosely um, on top of using the, the system, so. All right, um, so for a stroke survivor who's watching this, you know, what, how would they go about, you know, is this something that, you know, now with this FDA clearance, can we, can they order it online? Does it need to be prescribed through a, a clinician and, Let's mm -hmm. talk about the so reimbursement we are, and things like that. Yeah, yeah. And reimbursement is a big piece to it in which I'll talk a little bit more. There is a new program that if a device is designated a breakthrough device, plus also um, de novo classification, there is a program and it's in process right now, um, which is the MCIT program. And what that is aiming to do, and it's going through public comment right now, is an expedited pathway for those who have Medicare to have access to these technologies. And so we're following that very closely right now. And we're very optimistic that, that it'll be a good outcome for all involved. Um, and so that's what we're looking at as far as in hopes for our reimbursement as well. Any plans kind of, for, so obviously you, you've established yourself in the US market. We have a few Irish, UK, Canadian listeners as well. Is there any sneak peek of? <laughs> <laughs> I will say we're always looking at, at all markets at, at all times. So yeah. always. And I should preface in the US, it will, because I forgot to answer your last question, it, it will have to be prescribed by a physician. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. And are you able to offer us any um, sneak peeks perhaps is there anything else in the pipeline and with the, along this idea of this cutting edge bci well um they're always yeah we're always thinking i mean if we have a bci platform which we do of course we want to look at what are all aspects that we could address what are some other areas we could help improve in, in this patient population. So that is always on the table and we're always looking at how can we apply the technology we have in other ways to benefit others. So that is always on the table and there's always um, many ideas and focuses, but um, more to come <laughs> on that. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, so yeah, I think it's, you know, fascinating area and, you know, you guys have proven you know, that, that this, it works and, you know, stroke, you know, it, it's a lot around the engagement aspect. And I think that's when it's interesting to kind of look at your background and where you've come from, from that hands-on clinical experience, especially, you know, at OT, David's, you mm -hmm. know, a, a PT background. What, what's your, what was that transition like? Because now you're, I'd say back in clinical school, when you were going for OT, like you never heard of de novo or any of these no. experiences. like yeah. what's that transition been like and like what do you think I, has been sorry to jump in but like oh no. like from a ux and a design perspective because when we think of medical device like that's mm -hmm. key like what, what can ot's pts kind of bring into this new med tech space that that you think is currently lacking a whole lot um, it's, it's very exciting actually, because, um, I mean, I can't speak higher and I'm not just saying this cause I'm on here, but the team that, that worked behind this entire project 
we are all from so many different backgrounds. I'm just going to say that we have software engineers, biomedical engineers, we have neurologists, neurosurgeons, and, you know, OTs. And so we all kind of, you know, converge at one point, we have to talk the same language. And as a clinician, it truly is our job to advocate for the patient population. We've worked with them. We know them best. We know where the gaps are at. We know what their needs are. And so we can truly just help educate in development any technology, any technology to help any patient population. And of course, when it comes to user design and UX, I mean, it's huge because that's what's going to drive your, your motivation and engagement. If it doesn't work well for you, they're not going to use it. So, um, you know, looking at all aspects of functional limitations, educating the team on that, understanding in the stroke population, you have cognition, you have possible visual impairments, um, spasticity, and maybe even other comorbidities that you need to consider. Um, and how can you develop a technology that's going to be so easy to use and understand for that patient population so that you don't have that disengagement? Um, and so as a clinician, it's huge. Let me just I'm, say amen yeah. to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And just in the design of your product, when the first thing I said, this had to have been Lauren and Lauren squared. When, <laughs> when you talked about, when I when I read how the setup was and that considering the fact that you could don and doff this with one hand, like that's, mm -hmm. like yeah. that's thinking outside of the engineering side and into the mm -hmm. clinical application and actual practical use. So right. that's great. And it's came a long way and the evolution of the product has come a very long way. And when I first stepped on, we made the first prototype and we had only the technology that we could at that time. Our headset was an EEG headset that was gel-based and a patient had to inject gel in each sensor so that we had good contact. It had wires that went to a box and then a box that went to a handpiece. And so obviously that's not very user-friendly going forward. And so then it was a lot of user design and what can we do and what's the, you know, latest coming out that we can start testing. And that's where it was. Let's, you know, let's simplify this. Let's get rid of the cords. Let's, you know, basically find a headset that you just pop on. There's no gel and the signal quality is still perfect and what we need. Um, and then when it comes to the handpiece, is it comfortable? And with somebody with a high degree of tone or a moderate to severe, you know, degree of tone, can they coordinate easy enough to adhere a quick, you know, get your hand in, pop it back, make it simple. Um, because we know we're going to lose um, that engagement if we don't. So. That's interesting. Yeah. When you talk around that, like, have you designed around kind of caregivers and thinking around, you know, how you bring in that, like our, our approach and what we're, you know, we, we've worked on this time last year was a kind of behavior change program all around kind of your your lifestyle and designing your life post-stroke, right? So mm -hmm. it, uh, it was a lot to do with the caregiver and, you know, that, that aspect of you're going through this together, like your team and that, that part of it. Mm -hmm. how, how do you think about, you know, not just the survivor, but, you know, getting this into a home where, you know, there, there might be a lot of kind of necessary take, like, from, you know, that caregiver really having to be hands-on with the stroke, they, mm -hmm. they guide, yeah. them. is it, has there, was there a thought brought into that? Yeah, we, yeah, we have, um, and a lot of it truly, when we have a caregiver on board, we know they're super supportive. And yeah. so we will do training that the days where we would take, you know, spend one day when we were going to issue out the Ipsy hand system, if they had a caregiver, we'd bring it in, um, and do just a full hands-on training for about an hour, hour and a half. Um, and then, you know, taking videos, making sure they have everything they need to be successful. Um, but again, it's the same thing. Let's keep it very simple. Keep the instructions very simple, keep distractions to a minimum on the entire product and you keep it very, very simple because again, that's the only way it's going to be used. And I think we know as clinicians, a lot of, um, technologies end up collecting dust in clinics and, you know, maybe something went wrong. It hasn't been fixed or it takes too long to boot or, you know, it just, what have you. And so we take all of those considerations in mind of, you know, let's make it simple and it needs to work. <laughs> so, okay. yeah. Cool stuff. I'm more, I'm pretty Thanks. interested to hear more about what you're doing too, um, with the behavioral kind of design there. Yeah, um, we've so our approach, you know, we'd like to see and what we're trying to build is one a community of, of survivors and, and caregivers really who are trying to find and I think David and I connected and kind of the area that we're trying to drive is focused around this behavior change mm -hmm. 
the lifestyle after stroke, right? So with that comes in all aspects of, you know, physical rehab, OT, speech and language therapy. So we're trying to build a community and a place to kind of bring all those resources together. Um, and and it, our kind of pilot program that we ran, again, was it May? Yeah, it was this time last year. It was May. Yep. Yeah, for Strokes of Five Month um, during the pandemic. Um, you know, it was, it was a behavioral change from a five-week program that brought in key experts. And it was kind of our stepping stone to what we'd like to c- continue building. But, you know, the resource and the program is still available on demand. Um, and, and really, over, you know, with, with that as a first step, it's then bringing in folks like yourselves and kind of bringing this marketplace together of tools and resources that are there for, for the community. Because I think that's the biggest issue. It's you know, my mom, for instance, has really bad spasticity and the approach that she might take is to Google, you know, you, you mm-hmm. Google search and it's just a minefield of information. So I know. to kind of simp- just like you were saying, try to keep things simple. And that that's what we're trying to do with it. With an that's end. wonderful. No, and yeah, and, and such an unmet need. I think, mm-hmm. yeah, just that transition throughout the continuum is is what's needed. That's wonderful. You see it happening in, you know, diabetes and cardio, a a big, um, in our first podcast, we, or episode, we discussed a recent study that was looking at the cardiac rehab Mm -hmm. programs that are out there fully, fully structured 36 weeks. And, you know, when you look at stroke, it's just nothing there in terms of the structure. So yeah, you know, how could you create parallel there? Absolutely. Yeah. The continuum of care. And I think I've had this conversation a lot. Um, it's, it just falls short, I feel for all of our neurologically impaired, um, and access to resources, understanding what's really my pathway. What should I be doing? What shouldn't I be doing? Um, what type of lifestyle redesign should I be considering and who do I need to help support me in doing that? Do I have initiation to even get the support? And so, you know, everyone's story is so different and it's just such an unmet need. And, And truly that's why I am doing what I'm doing, even though I'm in this space and I've worked with the Ipsy hand and I absolutely love it. I think there's just such a, a health literacy and like in a clinical knowledge translation that really needs to get out there. And we have a lot of technology to do it and mm-hmm. any way that we can, the better. So. Yeah. Well said for sure. Yeah. Right. And it, so maybe just the last point, you know, that we talked a lot around technology and you know, at home rehab and lifestyle redesign, you know, where, where do you see, and a question that we always like to ask is if we could kind of hand you a magic wand, you know, what would that stroke rehab experience look like, um, you know, across? I wish, I wish it was a playbook. I wish it was a playbook um, that had a very strategic algorithm that this is, you know, patient, this is where you are acutely. And this is what, how we can track how you're doing, but this is where we need to go. And here's your resources. Here's your support groups. Here's anything that you need, because a lot of that again is missed. Um, that's where I would love to see stroke rehab going. I know right now it's pretty much, you know, I don't want to throw anyone under a bus, but we you can say that, it. <laughs> we know that once it, it, if they even make it to inpatient rehab, it's usually two weeks or less. And then are they going to a skilled nursing on home health? The intensity totally drops off. And in that time point is the worst time to have a drop off. And it's the time where we need to be intense and have the most support. And so that's just such an unmet need. Perfect. That makes, yeah, that was, that was brilliant. No, thank you. Um, you know, do you- and we'll be sure to put a lot of the sh- under in our show links. Um, your website has a lot of good information. So anyone who wants to take a little bit deeper dive into BCI and really getting inside the brain and seeing mm-hmm. how that ipsilateral contralateral and the whole premotor cortex versus what yeah. really makes this drives this, this change and this rewire. We hear a lot of talk around neuroplasticity, but um, there's mm-hmm. a one particular video. We'll put that in um, right. as well as um, any other information you might want to share with us where, where, by the time we um, get this up and record yeah. it, we can um, gladly put that in. Gosh. Um, <laughs> and your audience is primarily your stroke survivors. So um, I <laughs> clinicians as well. So if there's yeah. any information down the road about um, how how a clinician might um, come on yeah. board as maybe a uh, provider as well. 
Yeah, so um, we will be looking at towards the end of the year, hoping, fingers crossed, everything goes as planned, um, launching into the, the new year. So the best thing to do, whether you're a clinician, whether you're a patient or a caregiver, um, is just to subscribe on our website. We look at that very closely. If anyone has a specific question, info at neurolutions.com, we monitor that very closely as well. And our latest clinical opportunities and updates or any patient information on device um, access um, will be going out through that channel. So that is the best place to get the latest information. And Great. any OTs, PTs that are listening and they're like, this sounds fascinating. I want to take Lauren's route. Any positions open at the moment or? If you can... Not right now. Right now. <laughs> not, okay. not, not yet. <laughs> okay. Well, no. yeah, just say, I assume you, you release those on your career section of the web. Mm-hmm. If people yeah. are interested, cool. Yeah, I, it's a fascinating space for, you know, OTs to kind of end people. But we could wrap it up here. Um, you know, thank you again for your time, Lauren. Yeah fascinating no, discussion you. you know i think it's been super useful for for the audience um and hopefully you know we'll be able to see you guys in the market in 2022 yeah, yeah. we can't wait i can't wait <laughs> so exciting stuff well, thank you guys thank you lauren thanks right. lauren. Have, have a, a nice good day. one bye you now. too bye bye